I think you've already seen on the screen, we're in the book of Revelation. This is the fifth message in our series, uh, The Things That Are, the letter to Pergamum, Revelation 2, 12 through 17. Um, if you've been with us or if you're familiar with the book of Revelation, you know that the letter opens with seven letters given by Jesus Christ uh, to the aged apostle John to be sent to seven churches in seven cities in what is now Western Turkey, what was then the Roman province of Asia. In the first century AD, this region was um, a part of the Roman Empire. John received his vision uh, of the risen and glorified Jesus that's recorded here in the book of Revelation uh, in approximately 95 AD, or in thereabouts, while he was exiled for his witness for Jesus on an island in the Aegean Sea called Patmos, Uh, By order of the Roman emperor, Domitian, John apparently just wouldn't give up and wouldn't shut up uh, about Jesus, about the gospel, about the word of God. And uh, so he paid a price uh, in exile. I want to remind us as we continue this morning, um, I had someone say, well, I didn't know the revelation started like this. Um, And it does, and it's important because it, it, it sets what Jesus is saying to the church in um, concrete historical context. I think that's important to understand. And so as we said last week, each of these churches was, first of all, literal in existence. That these are uh, not to be understood, these churches, as merely symbolic or uh, as metaphor for something else. We don't have to scratch our chins and say, hmm, you know, I wonder what that really means. Each church is a real church in a real place made up of real people in real time. People like you and me uh, who were living um, everyday lives concerned about the same things that you and I are concerned about. Secondly, each one of these letters is for us spiritual in significance. That's not to say let's spiritualize everything. What it is to say is that there are things spoken by Jesus to each church that are as instructive and as formative or formational. Somebody told me that's not a real word, so but I made it up, so it must be. Uh, for us as disciples of Jesus Christ in the 21st century, uh, as they were for Christians in the 1st century. And third, if we'll take the time to engage in meaningful reflection on the, these things, we, we won't have to think too very long before we realize that they are equally practical in relevance today for uh, both the ways in which we carry out the life of our church and the ways uh, we each individually live and love and grow in obedience to Jesus Christ. So today we're coming to the third of those letters, um, the letter to the church in the city of Pergamum. Uh, Today, uh, the ancient city of Pergamum is the modern city of Bergama, Turkey, with a population last year of about 106,000. It lies 75 miles north of Izmir or Smyrna, 17 miles from the Aegean coastline. Uh, it's famous for many things uh, today, including its natural beauty and, of course, uh, the amazing ruins of ancient Pergama, but it's also renowned for Bergama carpets, uh, that are skillfully, beautifully woven of wool from that area. Uh, wouldn't be surprised if uh, some of you may have a Bergama carpet in your home. Um, there's a, a very profitable gold mining industry in the area. More recently, facilities have been established for uh, the manufacture of wind turbine blades, which really brings them into the 21st century. And additionally, the, the region has been known from Ancient times as what we Americans would call the agricultural breadbasket of Turkey. The name Pergamum is usually, uh, well, you'll encounter it in three ways. One is Pergamum, as I'm pronouncing it today, or Pergamon, like Pokemon, or Pergamos, Pergamos. However you pronounce it, the primary meaning of the name is elevated. It means elevated. Alternately, it's it's used for a tower, a fortified structure. And when you see the Acropolis uh, on which that ancient city was built, it's not hard to understand why it was named 
what it was. It stood magnificently 1,100 feet above the valley floor and the, the beautiful winding river Caicos. When it was founded by the Greeks around 300 BC, it was recognized as um, a great site for a fortress because it would be impregnable um, to to invaders. Uh, it easily defended. The, the region was um, under the Adelid dynasty for a couple of two, three hundred years, and and then in 133 BC that that kingdom, the larger kingdom, was bequeathed to Rome by Attalus the third, and the Romans then made Pergamum the capital of the province of Asia. Pergamum is among the best excavated cities in the Roman world with its Hellenistic theater, uh, the steepest uh, Roman theater in the world, its library that featured 200,000 volumes, scrolls, second only at the time to the library in Alexandria, Egypt. It's known for its many sculptures, shrines, temples. Uh, it's also home of the, the writing material that we know as vellum or parchment. As an interesting story behind that, because the Egyptians were concerned that the library in Pergamum was going to eclipse them, and they were proud of their library, the king of Egypt cut off the the export of papyrus from Egypt, the paper was made from. And and so um, the Pergamites or Pergamese or whatever you call them, um, someone there developed this concept of parchment, of a, a leather product that, that worked like paper. And, and so that's where it came from. It was invented and developed there in Pergamum. And the reason for the many sculptures and temples was, of course, the rampant pagan idolatry that was practiced in Pergamum. I, and I guess that's been true also of the other two cities we've visited in the past couple of weeks, hasn't it? But in Pergamum... In particular, every major deity in the Greek pantheon and the Roman pantheon had a temple. The lesser ones may have had shrines. Uh, a guy named Joe Stoll likened a pilgrimage to Pergam- Pergamum to uh, going to Hollywood or Beverly Hills and, and uh, hiring a tour bus and taking a tour of the homes of the the rich and the famous, you know, the movie stars. No matter which god or goddess you wanted to see, you could see that one in Pergamum. And no matter what you may have needed, whatever you may have desired or, or dreamt of, those gods and goddesses offered it. For example, if you arrived in Pergamum seeking justice, you might go to what was the second highest point on the Acropolis, to the great altar to Zeus, who was regarded as the most high God, the the king of kings and the lord of lords, the god of the sky, of lightning and thunder, of justice and fate. In fact, that... How many of you have been to Berlin? Any of you been to Berlin? Been to the museum in Berlin? If you go to the, the museum in In Berlin, the historical museum, that altar to Zeus uh, was removed from its place in Pergamum and taken to Berlin, and and an entire building was built to cover it. Uh, So you can see see it today, uh, mostly restored. Or say that you came to Pergamum for pleasure. Uh, Why not visit the Temple of Dionysus? Uh, the god of wine, of revelry, of fertility. Uh, He was known to the Romans as Bacchus. Uh, One of his symbols was the phallus, and ceremonies dedicated to him always involved a variety of sexually immoral practices. Dionysus promised eternal life. He, He catered to human lust, so drink a little wine, do a little dance, make a little love, get down tonight. That That's the temple of Dionysus. And drunken orgies were at the heart of the worship of Dionysus. And, and so what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, right? What happens in Pergamum stays in Pergamum. But, but the feast in the temple of Dionysus often became so frenzied that they would end up in the taking of human life. 
And in fact, it became so extreme and became so perverted that it offended even the Romans, so that in the city of Rome itself, the worship of Dionysus was eventually banned. If you needed food or, or wanted to be assured of a good crop, if you're single, want to be married, you're married and want to have a baby, you you'd, you wanted to be sure to pay a visit to the temple of Demeter. Or perhaps you came to Pergamum because you were sick. And in that case, you, you'd check in at the temple of Asclepius, uh, the god of medicine and of healing. Pergamum was famous as a center for healing. People came from all over the empire and beyond to what was known as the Asclepion, which was part hospital, part health spa. Uh, and in the Asclepion, it was the snakes that did the healing. Uh, some patients would be given a, a mixture of herbs that would send them into a trance. Uh, they'd be led into a dark room where they would lay down. Um, and as they slept, hundreds of snakes would slither over and around them as they slept. And it was believed that the spirits would give those patients a dream regarding the nature of their health issues, which in the morning they would report to the priests. Um, and that would inform your regimen, uh, regimen of treatment that would determine which things you would do. And then also in the morning you'd, you'd take and, and you'd take some clay and you'd make a model of that part of your body that, that, that uh, the spirits had told you actually needed treatment. And that would be part of um, the prayers that were offered to the gods. The caduceus, with its two snakes entwined around a staff, surmounted by wings, is the symbol for medicine to this day. You see, you recognize that symbol? See the serpents. That's the god Asclepius, the god of healing. And uh, so that dates right back to the city of Pergamum. Even hospitals were places of intense idolatry and spiritism. Or maybe you came with a need for wisdom to make some important decisions. And if so, then you'd be sure to visit the temple of Athena, a goddess of wisdom and of warfare who devised winning military strategies for the Romans. And if you wanted to make sure while you were there to affirm that Caesar was the Lord of Lords, your your Savior, then, then you'd walk to the highest point on the Acropolis and burn incense at the temple of the imperial cult, which in the first century happened to be dedicated to the emperor Trajan. In an inscription on a stone found in the ruins of Pergamum, Trajan is called the Lord of the land and the sea. His temple was was the only structure of Roman origin on the Acropolis at Pergamum. And the important thing about it was that it was built at a level even higher than the great altar to Zeus to, to symbolize his ascendancy over even the one regarded by the Greeks as the most high God. Another of the emperor's titles was Pontifex Maximus, which means the, the greatest bridge builder. And that title cast the emperor in the role of a priest who, who built bridges between earth and heaven. Interestingly, the the Pope of the Roman Catholic Church retains that title to this day, Pontifex Maximus, or the Pontiff. The Christians at Pergamum lived their daily lives surrounded by idolatry, surrounded by an idolatrous community. Uh, It was the very air they breathed, the water in which they swam. But as they read their Bibles, these new Christians found out that it was neither Caesar nor Zeus, but Jesus Christ, who is the true King of kings and Lord of lords. And they they learned that Jesus, not Dionysus, is, is able to deliver ultimate pleasure. Psalm 1611, at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. And they were astonished to learn of the acts of healing and and even raising the dead that Jesus performed by no more than a word or a touch. Instead of by serpents and mysterious dreams and utterances as in the Asclepion. 
And they came to understand that it is Jesus, not Asclepius, who's uniquely able to grant us the gift of life, life abundant and eternal. And they were encouraged to read of Jesus' miraculous feeding of the 5,000 and their families and come to know him as the bread of life that came down from heaven, which made Demeter look a bit pale and powerless. And to find that in Jesus, not in Athena, are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. There was a hymn sung by first century Christians, very possibly by Christians here in Pergamum, Paul included part of it, at least part of it, in his letter to the Philippians. It says this, Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. But their confidence in Jesus inevitably resulted in conflict. Conflict with their Jewish friends and relatives in the synagogue, rejection by them, uh, ostracism from their pagan neighbors. You know, it wasn't so much that Christians were in those days were persecuted for their faith in Jesus. They were persecuted because their faith was in Jesus exclusively. The Romans regarded Christians as atheists because they had no idols and they had no temples. To be Christian in Pergamum was to have your comfort, your your personal peace, your relationships, your employment, your social status, even your dwelling place violated, compromised in some way. Your your very life may be threatened because of your identification with Jesus Christ. How important to them then were the words that Jesus addressed personally to them in this letter to the church at Pergamum. Let's stand and read it together. Revelation chapter 2, verses 12 through 17. And to the angel of the church in Pergamum write, the words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, yet you hold fast my name, and you did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so that they might eat food sacrificed to idols and practice sexual immorality. So also you have some who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Therefore repent. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. This is God's word. You may be seated. As all seven letters do, this one begins with a description of Jesus, the one speaking to the angel of the church in Pergamum, right? The words of him who has the sharp, two-edged sword. In John's first encounter here in the book of Revelation with the risen, glorified Jesus, in, in chapter 1, verse 16, John reported that, that this vision of the, in this vision of the glorified Jesus, out of Jesus' mouth came a sharp, two-edged sword. And here in chapter 2, Jesus again describes himself to the church that way as him who has the sharp two-edged sword. And in doing so, he paints a very vivid and rich image. Let's take those three words one by one. Sharp, first of all. Sharp, sharp means razor sharp, like the, like a surgeon's scalpel. And like a scalpel, it, it also implies the idea of cutting for the purpose of healing. And, and even in the word, in itself, there's 
there's this uh, connotation of simultaneously anesthetizing and cleansing. Make note of that. We're going to come back to that. Two-edged in Greek is diastomen. It's pronounced a little differently than that, but I wanted you to hear it just that way. Diastomen, literally double-mouthed. And it pictures the sword coming from Jesus' mouth as having a a blade that on both edges is a drinker of blood. You go, ooh, right? Ooh. (laughs) I'm a huge fan of a series of novels by Bernard Cornwell called The Last Kingdom. It was a a passion that Greg Volkart and I actually shared in common. We each had read all of the books in the series, some of them multiple times. Uh, Pastor Evan has also uh, been reading those books. And the central character, this this happens like way back medieval times. The central character, uh, Uhtred of Bebenberg, by the way, it was made into a TV series. Some of you may have seen The Last Kingdom. Um, But the central character, Uhtred of Bebenberg, carries a broadsword, the long you know, a two-handed broadsword that to which he had given the name Serpent's Breath. <laughs> he also carries, carries a, sh- a short sword he calls Wasp Sting. But uh, Drinker of Blood, that, that's a pretty cool name for a warrior's sword too, wouldn't you say? The third word, sword, indicates a specific kind of sword, a particular type of sword known as a romphia. And this sword was developed by the Thracians in as early as the 4th or 5th century BC. It was first of all a spear and then they refined it into a, a long sword that, that the Thracian warriors wore on their right shoulders and After losing far too many soldiers in battle against Thrace, the Romans dreaded their swords and they added extra reinforcing ribs to their helmets and body armor to protect against the power of this particular weapon. It was slightly curved, it was sharpened on both edges so that in battle it could be used for both thrusting and slashing. Uh, I'll spare you the gory details, but it could literally uh, cut a soldier in half with one draw of the blade. Romphia is is also the word that old Simeon used in Luke 2.35 in the temple when he encountered Mary and Joseph and, and, and he blessed the infant Jesus. And you remember he said in the course of that conversation, he, he prophesied that a sword, and he uses the word Romphia, a Romphia would one day pierce Mary's soul too. And then down in verse 16 of, of today's passage, Revelation 2, the, the Romphia, the blood drinker of Jesus' mouth, uh, becomes a fierce weapon of war against false Christians and an instrument for surgical correction and healing for the church. Interesting description, huh? Secondly comes commendation in verse 13, and Jesus begins to speak to the church, and his first words affirm, I know where you live, where Satan's throne is. I know where you live, where Satan's throne is. So was this a a reference to the temple of Trajan, the Roman emperor? Or maybe to the great altar, to Zeus? Or was it just an allusion to the general pervasive spiritual darkness and gloom that that hung low like a cloud over a wicked, idolatrous Pergamum? The fact is we don't know exactly what Jesus was trying to say there, but here's what we know. We know that he knew. He knew. He, He knew because he saw, because he is attentive, because he walks around among the churches, because there's nothing that escapes his gaze. He knew what they were up against, which was the the opposition and the adversity against which they struggled to follow him faithfully and fearlessly. 
The late British theologian John Stott wrote, he is aware that his people are surrounded by a non-Christian society and are exposed on all sides to the pressure of the world's standards and values. Their little boat is tossed about by the winds and waves of strange doctrines. Their fortress is bombarded by the gunfire of alien waves of strange doctrines. They feel besieged. Notice with me, will you, the, the descriptive verbs that he uses to describe the church in Pergamum, surrounded, exposed, tossed about, bombarded, besieged. Uh, That description could apply equally to the experience of many Christ followers today. If you identify with any of those words, know this morning for a fact that Jesus sees, he knows, he understands where you live, the circumstances in which you live, and the spiritual opposition that you face every day. He continues to commend them in verse 13 for their faithful tenacity, yet you hold fast my name, and if you did not, and you did not deny my faith even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. They held fast his name. You know, when you choose to follow Jesus, and if you choose to really follow Jesus, to rest your faith in him, to to bear his name, you'd better hold on. You'd better hold fast to his name. It's like that moment when you get into the, the seat of a roller coaster. And the attendant hopefully comes along and locks that thing in place that holds you from falling out of that sucker on the, on the, the rapid descents. And the Christian life is in many ways like a roller coaster. I'm reminded of some young people I saw this summer swinging on a rope from a bridge out into a lake and, and dropping into the water. I so wanted to join them. The rope was tied really high in a tree and so that when they launched off of this bridge, it was a long ride. And there was one girl there who clearly wasn't sure that she had the strength to hold on to that rope. Uh, She was afraid she might drop off too early. It was a legitimate fear because in that particular setting, you had to clear a bunch of really big rocks. And it was a fairly long drop to those rocks. Could have been severely injured or killed if you let go. So I was watching this thing kind of unfold and I was relieved when she gripped that rope tightly and swung out into the lake holding on for dear life until she reached the point where she could let go and plunge into the cool water. And perhaps that's an apt analogy. You know, holding fast to Jesus for dear life until you reach your destination. The name of God in, in both Old and New Testaments represents not just a title or a label, but the fullness of his character, who, the fullness of who he is in all of his attributes, his, his will and his ways. And you and I can hold fast to his name because his name is entirely beautiful. It's entirely kind. It's entirely loving, entirely gracious and merciful, entirely faithful, entirely trustworthy. They held fast his name, nor did they deny his faith. What's meant by the faith? There's faith in Jesus in his power, in his promises, his provision. But there's also the faith. And when we talk about the faith, we're talking about the the full body of sound doctrine revealed in the Bible, revealed in God's word. And the struggle that the Christians in Pergamum had dealt with every day was, was one between good and evil. 
But as part and parcel of that struggle, that conflict between good and evil, was the conflict between truth and error. Truth and falsehood. Truth and relentless demonic deception. They hadn't denied their faith in Jesus, their their personal faith in him. And Jesus says, neither have you denied the faith. They had determined never to compromise the truth, even to the point of martyrdom. And this was true, Jesus said, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you. And again, he uses that phrase, where Satan dwells. You know, we actually know very little about this guy, Antipas, uh, who he was, even though, as around many biblical characters, a a fair volume of tradition kind of accumulated around him. Imagination, actually. Most of what we know for sure is right here in verse 13. And I think what we read about him in verse 13 is enough. Jesus called him my faithful witness. My faithful witness. How great would it be to know that the Lord Jesus is willing to speak of you in those terms? And we know that he was killed for the name of Jesus in Pergamum, where Satan lived, where Satan had his throne. Tradition says that Antipas was was put to death in one of the most cruel and horrific forms of execution ever devised. Um, Amir Tsarfati wrote in Revealing Revelation, this Antipas, of whom the Lord speaks, was a true man of God. But as we saw with Smyrna, that doesn't keep you from enduring suffering. The people of the city took this man and tried to force him to denounce the Lord. When he refused, they roasted him in a bronze bull-shaped altar. Despite this persecution, there were many in the church who remained faithful to God, keeping their eyes on him and living righteously. The picture doesn't do that ball-shaped altar justice. I'll spare you the details, but it was a life-size bull with a door in the side. And the victim was placed inside that bull and a fire was lit under the belly of the bull and the victim roasted to death. We have to hold fast to Christ because Satan will always try to subvert, to undermine our faithfulness to him. And some of us by overt persecution, some of us by covert seduction. But Jesus comes along and strengthens our resolve by commending those who are true to him and by exposing those who are deceitful as well as those who are deceived. In verses 14 to 15, He comes to reproof. There was a, despite all of that, there was a problem or a set of problems in the church at Pergamum. But I have a few things against you, Jesus says. You have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so that they might eat food sacrificed to idols and practice sexual immorality. So also you have some who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. See, while while most of the Christians seemingly in Pergamum were holding fast to the name of Jesus and, and to the faith, there were some who were instead holding fast to false doctrines, specifically the teaching of Balaam and the teaching of the Nicolaitans. We spent some time thinking about the Nicolaitans in the earlier letter to the church in Ephesus, where, where Jesus said he hates the works of the Nicolaitans. The Nicolaitans were probably a Gnostic sect, and one of the distinctives of the Gnostics was that they downplayed the value of the human body so that, um, you know, on one end, there was extreme 
flagellation of the body, punishment of the body. And on the other end, there was um, extreme uh, sexual immorality. But the body didn't matter, according to them. And that's what they would have taught. That's what they would have practiced. The teaching of the Nicolaitans seems to have been contemporary to the first century church. Um, But to understand the teaching of Balaam, we have to reach clear back into the Old Testament, specifically to the book of Numbers, chapters 22 to 25. You'll you'll be glad to know that I'm not going to read those for us. But it was in the days of the Exodus when Israel came up out of Egypt and and they were so great in number and so intimidating were the stories that were spreading like wildfire of their conquests over powerful kings and kingdoms. That the very sight of them from the mountaintops of Moab was unnerving to a Moabite king named Balak or Baal-Ak. He was quite sure uh, he couldn't defeat them militarily. And so he devised another plan. He he hired this prophet whose name was Balaam or Baal-Aam to, to curse the Israelites. And on three occasions, Balaam attempted to do just that. But on each of the occasions, God miraculously intervened And so instead of curses, God put eloquent words of blessing in the mouth of Balaam for the Israelite people. He tried to curse them, but but God only allowed him to speak blessing. It's an amazing story. It's worth reading, Numbers 22 to 25. So King Balak was frustrated, of course. He was angry at at the failure of his plan. And so Balaam said, I I don't know what else I can do for you, but, but here's an idea. How about you send some beautiful Moabite women into the camp of Israel to seduce the men sexually and to induce them to eat food sacrificed to the pagan Moabite idols? And so those women went into the camp and they said, you know, uh, I like to worship with sex. Anybody want to worship with me? Wildly successful strategy. But it resulted in God severely judging both Israel and the Moabites for their wickedness. Uh, All of those among the Israelites who had sinned with the women of Moab were put to death. And an additional 24,000 Israelites died by a plague. So the teaching of Balaam within the church at Pergamum must have involved Christians compromising with pagan idolatry. It's not hard to imagine that the combination of food sacrifice to idols with with sexual immorality probably points to the common practice of pagan idolatry of participating in a sacrificial meal and indulging in ritual sexual intercourse with temple prostitutes. The Apostle Paul warned the believers in Corinth about this very temptation. He said, what do I imply then, that food offered to idols is anything, or that an idol is anything? No. I imply that what pagan sacrifice they offer to demons and not to God. I do not want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. So John is the writer of Revelation and also the writer of 1st, 2nd, 3rd John wrote, Little children, keep yourselves from idols. It's all too easy to slip back into the habits and the practices of our life before we committed our lives to Jesus, isn't it? I mean, it's so easy. So easy to slip back into those well-worn patterns those well-worn ways of thinking and acting. One one little trigger, one little seduction, one little deception, and, and suddenly we're engaged in full-blown unfaithfulness and disobedience. The names Balaam and Nicholas have a similar meaning. They, they both mean to conquer the people. 
And, and the teachings of each of them seems to have had the effect of leading believers into compromise with sexual immorality and false worship. And again, Amir Sarfati commented, sadly, this Nicolaitan belief isn't much different than what we're finding in the church today. Abortion is becoming more accepted within many denominations. Heterosexual and homosexual immorality are rampant. Recently, a transgender person was installed as a bishop in the Evangelical Lutheran Church. The trend is moving far away from Scripture. If you remain faithful to biblical morality, you will soon find yourself in the minority in the church. Often, it takes only one act to trigger former habits or begin new ones. We must be diligent. We must be committed to righteousness. And we must be in the word and in prayer each and every day because we cannot fight the world, the flesh, and the devil on our own. Amen? In verses 16 to 17, then, Jesus issues words of correction. Correction. Therefore, repent. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The problem, (laughs) the problem was not that the church was in Pergamum. The problem was that there was a whole lot of Pergamum in the church. And so Jesus called them to repent. He called them to change their mind, to change their conduct, to change their behavior. And there was an urgency about it. The alternative was, as for the Israelites in Moab, to become liable to God's judgment. Interestingly, the end of the story of of Balaam is in Numbers 31, verse 8, where it says that Balaam himself was slain by the sword when the Lord executed his vengeance on the Midianites for what they had done. I mentioned earlier that the sword of Jesus' mouth was as sharp as a surgeon's scalpel. Notice that when he comes, in this warning that he's giving us here, when he comes, it will be what military tacticians call a precise surgical strike. Check out the pronouns in verse 16. Therefore, repent. If not, I will come to you soon. I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. So don't confuse what Jesus is saying. His warning, I will come to you, isn't a reference to the second coming. It's a reference to a personal visit that Jesus himself would make to execute judgment on unfaithful Christians within the church. I will come to you corporately and I will wage war on them individually. It's Jesus acting actually in mercy and and compassion to attack spiritual disease and to eradicate it from his bride the church. By the way, we've seen that word soon before in our short time already in Revelation. It it doesn't mean it's going to happen tomorrow or in the next five minutes. What it means is that when it happens, it's going to happen swiftly. It's going to happen suddenly. Ever pause and consider what it is that makes us distinctive as Christians today? What, what really sets us apart? More, or, or more specifically, what makes you different? What makes you personally stand out from the crowd when it comes to your Christian faith? I, I hope you do. At least occasionally. How, how am I different from the world? How, how am I really different from my neighbors? I ran across a thing the other day on on Facebook. It was a little meme, and it said a, an Amish farmer was asked if he was a Christian, and he answered, I don't know, ask my neighbor. Great test. In a lot of churches today, you're not going to hear sermons about the seriousness of sin. 
You're not going to hear about the necessity of repentance or the ra- requirement of radical discipleship. In, in fact, some church services are more like a moral therapy session, aren't they? I mean, you, they're great. You leave feeling a lot better about yourself. And I've had more than one person over the years accost me, you know, after a church service and say they don't come to church to be reminded of their sin only to leave feeling worse about themselves. After all, they came to church to be affirmed and encouraged. And I've reminded some of them that in the Bible on every occasion that a person had a personal encounter with the Holy God, they were not only made acutely conscious of their own sin, but also believed that they were about to die for it. So if you can go to church without being made aware to some degree of the real condition of your heart, then you haven't encountered God there. And neither do many churches say much about hell or eternal judgment anymore. After all, it's a little embarrassing, isn't it, to be one of those people that actually believes that God might keep his word and cast some people into the lake of fire. And so instead they either rationalize it into mere symbol or metaphor or explain it away somehow, or better yet, avoid the subject altogether. Instead of teaching that Jesus is the only way, many pastors these days take a step back and they'll say, well, I believe that Jesus is the only way for me, but I really can't speak for others. And neither will you hear much in many churches today about the necessity of suffering for the sake of the name of Jesus. Or about denying yourself and taking up your cross daily to follow Jesus. See, God's word is pretty clear that suffering is to be anticipated as part and parcel of our walk with God. Even if it's as minimal as the struggle between the spirit and the flesh. But in an increasing number of churches, you'll hear instead that God wants you to live your best life now, that he wants you to be healthy, happy, and prosperous, and wants your children to have straight teeth, and that if you have just enough faith, you can have all of that. See, when you stop and think about it, if Jesus was disturbed about these things in Pergamum, what must he think of us today? Come on, really? Really? Who, who, who lose our edge, who, who lose our difference, who lose our distinctiveness as disciples of Jesus by an ongoing series of compromises around the edges of our lives. See, if Jesus called them to repent, do you, do you think he might call us today to repent as well? You think? Yeah, I think so too. The good news is that Jesus closes this letter with a promise of reward. Reward. Verse 17, To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. Well, there goes Jesus being all mysterious again, right? How are we supposed to understand this stuff? Well, there are three symbols in verse 17 that are definitely difficult to understand. And you think that because I'm a pastor, I should be able to explain it to you. So I'm going to try. To to the one who conquers, Jesus promises, first of all, some of the hidden manna. What exactly did he mean by that? Well, manna reminds us of God's faithfulness to the children of Israel in the wilderness when they came up out of Egypt in the Exodus. Psalm 78 verse 24 recalls that that he rained down on them manna to eat and gave them the grain of heaven. I, I, I love that. He rained down on them manna to eat and gave them the grain of heaven. You know what the word manna means? It, it means, what is it? <laughs> There was something a little nondescript in it, and it fell from heaven like snow. Or here in Psalm 78, 24, like rain. I had the privilege, uh, questionable privilege, one time of visiting the Kellogg's factory in Battle Creek, Michigan. 
And I had the horrifying experience of seeing cornflakes before they were caramelized and smelling them. And that's kind of my image of manna, that it was this white, flaky, what is it? (laughs) But it was nourishing to the Israelites. In Exodus 16, Moses directed Aaron, the high priest, to put some of that manna in a jar and to preserve it inside the Ark of the Covenant as, as a memorial to be kept throughout all generations as a reminder of God's provision, as a ma- reminder of God's nourishment. And I wonder, is it, is it possible that to those at Pergamum who refused the banquets of the pagan gods and goddesses, that Christ will give the manna of his eternal banquet in the kingdom of God, in the kingdom of heaven? Or is it possible that the hidden manna is, in fact, Christ himself, that what he's promising them is himself? He said in John 6, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven. But my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. What do you think? You think I might be onto something there? The white stone is perhaps more of a puzzle. (laughs) There are several theories about this, and the one that makes the most sense to me is, is this one, that in the ancient world, when, when the emperor or the governor or some other important person invited people to his banquet hall or, or to a party, or to a festivity of some kind, that person would receive a white marble stone on which their name was engraved. And that became your ticket to the event, and, and, and you'd show it at the door to gain admission. And when you come to the new name that's written on that white stone, the the mystery kind of deepens further, I think. Jesus says that the new name is known by no one except the one who receives it. Like a secret, intimate pen number that only you know. Hmm. Hmm. Might it be the name of Christ himself? hidden at the moment from the world, but to, re, but to be revealed in the future as the name above all names. A name we've never heard before. Or might it be your new name, known right now only by Jesus, based on what only he knows about your changed character as the result of the power of the cross and the transformative power of the Holy Spirit in you, the new redeemed you, the new you in Christ, given a new name based on your character, based on your attributes. There's only one way to find out, right? And that is to transfer your trust to Jesus. Him only. To rest your faith firmly in Him. And then just hold fast to His name. Hold on with everything you've got. Hold on tight until He comes. How good to know that we are only able to hold tight to Him because He holds tight to us. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for this letter to the church at Pergamum. Thank you for their model of faith. Thank you for the unyielding faithfulness of Antipas. Thank you that we'll see him in heaven. And Lord, may we be among those who hold fast to your name, 
who hold fast to the faith and hold on tight to you until we reach our final destination. And we pray it in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen.